you know, I, I always think that doing webinars is so interesting because the wonderful thing about it is that we could all be in our pajamas and nobody would know, right? <laughs> the bad thing about it is that, of course, I cannot see any of you or read any of you. And so hopefully, um, if you have questions, you know, definitely shoot those out um, and that will be uh, helpful to me as well. So like Joe said, my name is Andrea Zulig. I am a licensed clinical psychologist. Um, I also work for Melrose Center, which is one of the area's leading eating disorder specialty centers. We have inpatient, residential, outpatient, basically all the levels of care there. I also work with people who have undergone bariatric surgery. And in my past, I did um, not so, uh, far away past, I did evaluations for people who were interested in bariatric surgery. So basically what I'm going to be talking about today, now is this not advancing? Let me see. Okay, so what I'm going to be talking about today is um, I'm going to start out with the physiology of bariatric surgery and go over some of the most common forms and types of bariatric surgery that you may see in your own clients. Um, then I'm going to get to some uh, pre-surgery substance and eating disorders because that is the focus of the talk today, talking about the effect of bariatric surgery on substance disorders and eating disorders. And we do see people that have not had a history of those before, but that they do actually develop them afterwards. So I'm going to talk about that, and then we're going to get to two case studies. And then hopefully have time for questions, of course. So, um, all right. So this is the digestive system. And um, Please uh, <laughs> humor me a little bit because I'm, I'm playing around a little bit with some new features here, which I think are, are pretty cool. So if you, if you think about your digestive system, okay, and maybe some of you are eating lunch right now, so this is actually the best time ever to talk about the digestive system, right? <laughs> so this, oops, let me see here, pen tool, okay. This right here, that's the liver. This right here is the esophagus. And so if we can imagine that food, you know, goes into our mouth, it goes down the esophagus, some people call that the food tube, then it slides down into the stomach, goes eventually into the small intestine where it's uh, has a nice little ride all the way down, and then eventually goes up into the large intestine all the way over and then boop, back into the colon. So, Basically, that is what we see um, when we are eating. Up here also is the gallbladder, in case anybody was wondering what that was. Now, what some people, let me go back a little bit. What some people don't know is that when we digest food, we are digesting all of the nutrients and actually calories as well, not just through the volume of food that ends up here, in the stomach, but we are digesting this really and absorbing it the whole way down. So basically calories are absorbed through the walls of the stomach and through the walls of the large and small intestine. So really when people are morbidly obese, so more than hundred pounds overweight, so a BMI of 40 plus, and they come in for wanting needing bariatric surgery, the goal is really to minimize, of course, the amount of food and the amount of calories that they're taking in. So I am going to now talk about four main types of uh, bariatric surgery that we are seeing today. And I think that the most common one is the slide that's up right now. And that's, I think, the one that we know the most, which is, I'm trying to get out of this pen, which is called the Roux and Y gastric bypass. And for most people, when they refer to bariatric surgery, a lot of times they are referring to this. This is the one that really has been um, the most popular type of bariatric surgery over the past 20 years. And now that's really being replaced by the sleeve, which I'll talk a bit about later. So what happens, <laughs> I'm going to play with this pen again. What happens with the Roux and Y, okay, is that the goal here is not only to 
um, minimize the amount of calories that the body absorbs, but also the amount of nutrients that the body absorbs so that the person can actually lose weight. So this is one of the few types of bariatric surgery, which is also considered um, a malabsorption procedure. So what happens, the same stuff as before, you know, you're eating your food, everything's good. Um, but what they do, what the surgeon does is he or she will go in and um, you can see here, this part right here, what they do is they, they sew, they cut apart and they kind of sew a little, a little pouch here, which separates it from the rest of the stomach. So instead of having this whole stomach area to fill with food, the person only has this little tiny pouch right here. So what that does then is that then, let me show you on the slide above, they also actually cut the small intestine and they reroute the small intestine to this pouch. So if you look at the slide above, you can see, <laughs> I'm going to try to take apart some of, take off some of these so you can actually see some of this. What you see here is, you can see that this is really where the small intestine is going. Here, you can see that the small intestine has been rerouted so that it's actually going up here. So what happens is people eat food, it goes into the pouch, then it goes directly into the small intestine and completely bypasses the rest of the stomach there. So basically what happens is up to 35% of the, of the person's body weight can be lost within the first year and a half. And for people who are morbidly obese, they can lose up to even 100 pounds in a year. That is not atypical. Now, because there are, um, there's malabsorption here and they are not absorbing nutrients, they also need to take vitamins for the rest of their lives. Now, the next procedure that I want to talk about is banding. So this is, this has been much more common over, um, I would say like the last 15, 10, 15 years. I don't think that they're quite doing as much of it anymore um as that is being replaced by the sleeve that i'll talk about in a bit but with the adjust with the adjustable gastric banding basically the um what people like about this is that you do not have the malabsorption feature um and it is not quite as invasive so people do not think of it as oh my gosh my stomach is getting completely um torn apart and rerouted um in fact, with the band, if somebody really needs to, it, the process can be reversed, though, of course, we don't recommend that. So with the band, what they do is they put a band around the upper part of the stomach where the pouch would be when we talk about the roux and why. So it's the same type of thing where the pouch holds less food. So, and I should have mentioned this with the roux and why, when you have, um, when you have what is essentially like a smaller stomach, that can hold only maybe two teaspoons, two tablespoons of food at a time, and then eventually be up to a cup of food, but no more, people are going to feel much fuller than they, than they with, a, with a smaller amount of food. And the band can be adjustable to allow for um, a smaller pouch. So this is the sleeve. So with the vertical sleeve gastrectomy, what it is is again, like the, like the band, this is a restrictive only procedure where it restricts the amount of food that somebody can eat, but it does not result in malabsorption of nutrients. So what happens here is you can see that the surgeon actually comes in and removes the vast majority of the stomach. So they actually cut it off, they remove it. So it's a pretty intensive invasive procedure. And then the person is left with this sleeve here. Now, um, it is, it, it's found to be more effective than the band. Um, and at the same time, you don't have the rerouting of the intestines like you do in the ruin Y. And now with the last one here, um, this is called the duodenal switch. 
Now that is not being used very often, but it is starting to be used a bit more, particularly in people that are um, quite morbidly obese where they have a BMI of 50 or higher. And just to remind you, a normal BMI is about 19 to about 24.9, 25 to 29.9 is considered overweight, uh, 30 and above is considered obese, 40 and above is morbidly obese. So we're talking about people that have a substantial amount of weight to lose. The reason for this is because this is probably our most invasive and intensive procedure. So here you have basically a combination of the sleeve where the lower stomach is removed, they make the sleeve, and then they um, create this duodenal switch with the intestines where they take one part of the small intestine off and attach it to the duodenum, which ends up being both a restrictive and a malabsorption procedure so that somebody can really lose the most amount of weight. Now, however, it's also um, a procedure that really reduces the amount of fat that somebody can absorb. And so that what ends up with that is that people have to be very careful about what they eat and they have to be extremely careful about the nutrients and vitamins that they are really getting in for the rest of their lives so that they don't have su substantial malnutrition. So I think of the duodenal switch as really being almost like a combination of uh, the ruin Y and the sleeve, even though it's, you know, it's, it's very different than that, but. So I'm just going to talk very quickly about what happens when we look at people who are considering bariatric surgery. So basically most people do, most, most psychologists will do a clinical interview. Um, they'll get lots of data. They'll check substance abuse history, legal history, eating behavior. They will try to get collateral information on that if they can, talking to therapists, um, loved ones. Um, they do some psychological testing. Some people will use the audit to look at substance abuse and most most hospitals and surgical centers will consider and ask for candidacy letters and to look over previous records. In an assessment, um, what we are looking at right now, what we're talking about today with substances and substance use and eating disorders, they really assess the whole range of alcohol use, substance use, abuse, dependence. They're looking at eating disorders, eating behaviors, and they really assess a wide range of addictive behavior over the lifetime. Because what we are trying to look for is any possibility of impulsivity, proneness to addiction, proneness to compulsive, compulsive behaviors, and how um, this is going to be managed after surgery to make sure that people are really in the best place that they can be prior to surgery. And if they do have difficulties, it doesn't rule them out from surgery. It just means that we might want them to be in a different place with, lots of, with some more support therapy treatment before to make sure that um, they are the best candidate and they're in the best place that they can be so that they don't regret it basically and that they don't have a lot of the major medical problems or psychological problems that can happen after surgery when people aren't prepared. We do see a whole lot of psychological conditions in people prior to surgery. Um, 46 to 58 percent of people have these axis one disorders. I put axis one in quotes because of course according to the DSM-5, we no longer have axes. So we're talking about depression, anxiety. Those tend to be our, our biggest heavy hitters. 10% of people do seem to have ADHD, which will be somewhat important because we are looking at impulsive behaviors. Um, 10 to 50% binge eat, which we are going to be looking at very carefully. And one to 8% are engaging in substance abuse or have a lifetime history of substance abuse. Now, interestingly, people who are looking at and undergoing bariatric surgery tend to have a much higher lifetime history of substance abuse disorder than 
taken in the general population. And you can hypothesize a bit of what the reasons for that may be. So why is this an issue? Why is it an issue that people 10 to 50% of people have um, binge eating disorder or binge or that so many people have a substance abuse history? So one of the things that we find is that this often isn't a terrible surprise, but people in particularly in particular with alcohol, and I'll talk about that in a minute, but people who have a history of alcohol use disorder are extremely vulnerable to alcohol use and abuse after bariatric surgery. So if somebody has a history of alcohol abuse, we are going to be all over them in terms of making sure that they are well, well prepared before they have bariatric surgery so that they don't relapse. Um, and people who have never had any substance abuse issue whatsoever can develop them afterwards. We see very high numbers of people who use substances for the first time after bariatric surgery, actually, or who end up um, with an addiction to alcohol. Now, in terms of eating disorders, just to make something clear, obesity is not an eating disorder. Sometimes people will think that obesity is an eating disorder or they will assume that people who are obese or morbidly obese must binge eat. Um, there is a correlation between binge eating and morbid obesity. However, everybody who is obese doesn't binge and everybody who binges isn't morbidly obese. So um, we're not as concerned about that. However, people who do have an eating disorder history, so binge eating where they feel out of control, uh, bulimia, anorexia, um, that would be like a, a history and you know, a, a history of anorexia nervosa, may be more prone to relapse. And even patients who have never had an eating disorder before in their lives may have eating disorder issues afterwards. So what are some reasons for this? So um, we talk a lot about the idea of addiction transfer. So addiction transfer, some of you may be familiar. I saw that a lot of you uh, were from um, some substance abuse facilities. You may be aware of the lovely whack-a-mole phenomenon that we talk about a lot, that one pops up, another goes down. Another goes down, something else pops up. So addiction transfer is really looking at the idea of somebody who has never really dealt with um, some of their own emotion regulation issues, issues of impulsivity, compulsivity, and when they get a handle on one thing, the underlying issues are still not really dealt with, and so they just basically channel that into something else. So one thing that I always like to talk about is, surprise, surprise, you know, <laughs> bariatric surgery does not solve emotion regulation difficulties. So if you have a patient that is having a lot of problems with emotions. That doesn't mean that this person has to have borderline personality disorder, but um, a lot of difficulties with coping and tolerating their own emotions that then they put into something else, such as emotional eating, grazing, then um, when they cannot do this anymore, or when it's more difficult to do this, they will probably find other ways to cope with these emotions that are probably also not healthy. So we see enormous amounts of gambling, um, shopping compulsions, alcoholism, um, promiscuity, uh, compulsive sexual behavior after bariatric surgery that people never had difficulties with before. We also see um, people channeling their emotions into uh, resorting to some different means to try to emotionally eat and, and do that around the limits of bariatric surgery. People with the weight loss that they are having, they have, people will talk about increased energy, which also results sometimes in increased impulsivity after surgery. Um, they get a lot of compliments, a lot of attention. Um, they may find themselves doing things that they never did before, um, going on dates, being very social. For people who have 
really dealt with morbid obesity for all of their adult lives and maybe even their adolescence and childhood, they may actually experience this almost this reemergence of adolescence that they never had before. And people will talk about basically, um, you know, I've worked with 50 year olds who are like, I feel like a 17 year old and I'm acting like a 17 year old and I'm kind of embarrassed because I feel a little out of control. So I'm going to be talking about this more in detail later, but with alcoholism in particular, one of the things that we find is that the first the first year after bariatric surgery, people are actually um, most hospitals and surgery centers will advise people to not drink for at least one year after surgery. You know, people do, but you know, it's recommended that they don't. Now, even after that first year, people have this have an increased sensitivity to alcohol intoxication. Um, part of this is because of the small pouch or sleeve or um, stomach or whatever it is that they have. The other part of this is that if they are having any malabsorption procedure, for example, the duodenal switch or the Ruin Y, alcohol actually gets absorbed very differently and they are at incredible risk for DUIs. We like to tell people that to be prepared that they may find themselves on the floor after one glass of wine. <laughs> and you have to remember also, they're not eating a whole lot of food. So if they're eating maybe up to like a, a cup of food at one time, that's not exactly balancing it out much. So people, particularly with the malabsorption procedures, they may actually blow into um, a breathalyzer a 0.08 after one drink. And like I was saying, gastric bypass or um, the duodenal switch, um, though we haven't really had any research, I think with alcohol and the duodenal switch yet, um, but I'm hypothesizing, it's probably, you know, we see that double the risk of alcohol dependence. Oops, here we go. All right, so the ASMBS stands for the American Society of uh, Metabolic and Bariatric Surgery. And they have some um, recommendations where, again, like I was saying before, they really hold a criteria of abstaining from alcohol or drugs for at least one year after surgery. Um, now I know that for us at Park Nicollet, we had, we recommend that regardless of whether or not somebody has a history of substance use. Um, now we also, and ASMBS also wants people to abstain from alcohol or drugs for at least one year before surgery, if they do have a history of substance use disorder. And of course, the purpose of that is to really decrease the possibility of relapse. And some programs might even have people sign a contract for this because they know that the risks are so great. Risk factors for substance use after surgery. So of course, what we talked about, regular problematic alcohol or drug use preoperatively, pre or actually any history of alcohol or drug use. People, I've had people that have said, oh, you know, I've been sober for 15 years. It's not a problem. I can go to bars and have my water. I'm not triggered. You know, I'm fine. I, I'm not going to have a problem after surgery. And they find themselves really falling down the rabbit hole. Smokers, um, for whatever reason, tend to be um, more at risk men, people who are younger, any issues with impulsive behavior or impulsive diagnoses. So ADHD, um, bipolar disorder, borderline personality disorder, um, anybody that has had a ruin Y, um, and I would imagine the sleeve as well. So any, I'm not the sleeve, the duodenal switch. So anything that is a, malabsor a malabsorption procedure family history of substance use or substance abuse, and finally, untreated trauma. 
So one of the things that we also see happening um, after bariatric surgery to both men and women, we see it more with women, but also to men, is that many people when they have had a history of sexual abuse or sexual trauma will put on weight unconsciously as a way of protecting themselves from adv unwanted advances, from um, further sexual trauma because they feel that it might be protective. Um, then when they start losing weight and they start getting more attention, this can be very frightening. Some people actually then cope them with that by abusing alcohol, particularly if they are having a relapse with PTSD symptoms, more nightmares, more flashbacks, getting down to a weight that they were when they were assaulted, memories. So I've got a lot of stats here. Um, but basically, just to let you know, after surgery, up to a fifth of patients develop alcohol use disorder within five years after ruin y gastric bypass. So here again, um, the thing that we're really concerned about here are the malabsorption procedures with bariatric surgery because the alcohol use disorder is going to be worse with that. However, with any bariatric surgery, there is risk due to the addiction transfer. 34 to 90% report new use of substances. So people who have never used alcohol before or who have used minimal alcohol or people who have used minimal drugs start using it for the first time. So again, part of this is that addiction transfer. I can't emotionally eat. I'm going to have a drink instead. Um, to cope with my sadness, my anxiety, a lot more socialization and social opportunities when people are um, have more energy and um, are smaller. And so they may have more access to substances. They may be going on more dates, um, going to parties, um, being introduced to drugs for the first time, perhaps. Um, and they may use alcohol also in terms of reducing some social anxiety that they may have about being in those situations. People, I've, I've said this, I think a number of times already, but people who have had the ruin y gastric bypass are more than twice as likely to develop alcohol use disorder than people who have the band. LAGB stands for laparoscopic uh, gastric banding. And then we see some interesting studies with the ruin y so some neurobiological animal studies show that when pe when these animals, I don't know what animals they were doing a ruin why on, <laughs> but I'm imagining these poor little rats getting like their, you know, their a little stomach pouch. But basically what they found was after animals had a ruin why done on them, um, they had in their brains, they actually had much more reward stimulation when they were introduced to alcohol than before having the ruin Y. So again, people are actually going to get more, um, kind of a more, more happy, you know, more good feelings, more reward feelings from drinking. And then with the malabsorption, the concentration is very high, very fast. So it takes a much shorter time for somebody to get intoxicated. So basically, I always have to throw, uh, stick the, the super cat slide in because I just think it's funny. So what we see is that super fast plus super concentrated plus super long lasting really equals super drunk. So with the ruin Y, people might have one to two drinks and get very intoxicated very quickly and it lasts a long time. So these, this is very different than what people may experience without having a ruin, without having bariatric surgery. So I've heard stories of people getting pulled over after maybe having like one, maybe two drinks, not being able to walk a line, getting a DUI, 
and explaining to the police officer that they only had one to two drinks and the police officer laughing at them because they are like, you know, barely standing up. So let's turn a little bit to eating disorders. So eating disorders pre-surgery, some of the things that we see as people would probably guess based on weight are that we see much more, um, much higher rates of bulimia nervosa, which is binging and purging, or binge eating disorder, which is just binging rather than anorexia nervosa. However, we do see that people sometimes have a history of anorexia nervosa, which has actually gone into binge eating or bulimia um, because we often see eating disorders being on a spectrum. We see a lot of people that actually may have an eating disorder, but that this gets totally disguised. So either they may have had an eating disorder that either they didn't recognize or um, was never treated, or they had a lot of longstanding eating disorder behaviors, which they just thought may have thought were dieting behaviors. So not eating fasting, uh, restricting, not eating um, for long periods of time, and then their body finally pooping out and binging at night. Um, purging behaviors, um, because they're either eating so much that then they feel sick and they purge and they, they feel like that's involuntary, um, or um, going for long periods of time without eating because they feel like that's what they need to do to lose weight. We see a ton of dishonesty, as you would imagine, about eating disordered thoughts and behaviors. And people who are morbidly obese who may really not be happy with their bodies and have really low self-esteem, a lot of people, and I think a lot of people in our society actually, think that losing weight is the answer to everything. That if I am thinner, I'm going to feel so much better about myself. I'm going to be happier. I'm going to be more confident. Um, I'm going to feel comfortable in my body. I'm going to be, I'm going to wear a bathing suit and feel fine. And then when people find out that actually some of those feelings and thoughts in your brain about yourself don't go away when you lose weight, they can, they can feel pretty discouraged. So we talked a bit before about binge eating disorder. We see binge eating in a large number of bariatric surgery candidates. However, I want to make something clear. Um, we see two types of binge eating. And some of this is more what traditionally with the DSM, we would actually not necessarily call binging. It would actually be very, very large amounts of overeating, but it's planned and, it, and the person doesn't feel out of control when they're doing it. So one thing that sometimes we see in morbidly obese patients is that they have what I call physiological binging, okay? I, I, I just say this, um, you know, don't quote me on this, I made this up, but, but physiological binging where basically it takes a tremendous amount of food to have them feel full. So either two things are happening, either um, they cannot tell their feelings of fullness at all and they're just completely out of touch with that or for whatever reason it just takes a ton of food for them to do that and so these are people that they will say i eat um you know half a cake i eat um i eat two main meals at a time before i feel full these are all things that normally with that amount of quantity we would look at that and say oh my gosh that is really binging However, the thing that is more important to us is people who are eating binge-worthy amounts of food, but they feel completely out of control in doing it. So they feel full past the point of feeling, they, they feel, they keep eating past the point of feeling full, they may feel sick afterwards, and they feel like they can't stop. That group of people is going to have a tremendous amount of problems after bariatric surgery if this is not addressed before bariatric surgery. Because the thing that bariatric surgery does is it just makes the pouch smaller 
the stomach smaller so that people feel full faster. If people are feeling, are continuing to eat past fullness, that's not going to necessarily stop them from continuing to eat. And I'll talk in a little bit why, how they are able to do that. After surgery, people who have eating disorders or develop eating disorders after surgery, what do we see? These people tend to be older. Of course, these aren't our adolescents because ideally adolescents are not having bariatric surgery. Um, when we talk to them afterwards, they may say, oh yeah, well, you know, I did have problems with binging or I did have problems with throwing up or um, doing all these extreme weight loss behaviors before, but I never wanted to tell anybody or I didn't tell the psychologist because I didn't want that to stop me from having surgery. Sometimes we run into a little bit of a conundrum because people will have nutrient um, deficiencies or medical complications, which will cause them to lose great amounts of weight and they'll be having a lot of problems after surgery, a lot of prob problems with vomiting, um, problems with keeping food down, eating even smaller amounts than you're supposed to. Um, and you gotta kind of piece out a little bit and tease out, is that due to, um, what is the function of that? Is the function because they are compulsively trying to lose weight to the point that is becoming an eating disorder? Or is, is this mechanical? Is there something that is actually going wrong after surgery? Is this a complication? So we still have a lot of people that binge post-surgery. And so binging here is going to be, you know, people who binge after bariatric surgery cannot consume the same amount of food as people who binge who don't have bariatric surgery. But the idea is still eating more food than would be considered um, a regular portion or that the person would be able to normally consume with the pouch and um, that they feel out of control, unable to stop, and of course, a large amount of guilt and shame afterwards. So of this one fourth, um, I'm going to drop down to the, the two lower bullet points for a minute. The, the way that people can binge, okay, is some people will eat what they what we call slippery foods. So those are foods that go down easily and you can get large amounts of them in at one time. So this can be um, this can be ice cream. This can be um, you know some types of other desserts, sometimes cheesecake, sometimes um, certain kinds of pie, um, soft cookies, things like that that you can get a lot in milkshakes. And people will also drink fluids during meals so that it flushes out the stomach pouch, which can allow binging. So one of the rules of bariatric surgery is that people are supposed to not drink fluids with meals because the idea is that the food will fill up the stomach pouch and then people won't feel hungry. If they're drinking like a half an hour before, during a meal, or a half an hour after their meal, the pouch gets flushed out. And then what happens is that then they have all this room um, to, fill the, to, to fill up again. And they notice that. They, they feel like they haven't eaten. They feel hungry again. So people could actually do this all day long if they wanted to. They could eat a little, eat a cup of food, drink, flush it out, eat a cup of food, drink, flush it out. So we can have compulsive eating or binging there. Also, sometimes people can eat high fat foods, which causes what, what we call dumping syndrome. This happens with the malabsorption procedures only. Um, and this can be a way of purging. Um, it's certainly not comfortable, but for about 50% of people that have had a malabsorption procedure, when they eat high fat foods, they will feel 
sick to their stomach, get diarrhea, sometimes have vomiting. And so people will sometimes use that actually as a way to purge food. Atypical anorexia. Okay, so we do have, we, we do see people that have more anorexic tendencies sometimes. So these are people that tend to be really hung up on good foods, bad foods, not eating for hours, then overeating, um, feeling like they can never eat certain foods and then eating them in great amounts because they're the forbidden fruit. Um, one of the things that we see after bariatric surgery is that some patients um, actually meet all the criteria for anorexia nervosa with the exception of weight. So you can see somebody that is still obese or overweight or normal weight. However, their hair is falling out, they have bradycardia, very slow heart rate, um, their blood pressure is all over the place, um, they're very weak, and they, they see themselves still as fat, and all they are thinking about over and over again is weight, shape, and appearance, and eating as little as possible to try to lose as much as possible. With the DSM-5, um, that has been brought in so that we can now name this as atypical anorexia nervosa. So we would um, diagnose that as other specified eating disorder with the subtype of atypical anorexia nervosa. Some people also chew and spit. Um, I hope everybody's done eating lunch by now. <laughs> but one, one thing that happens is that people, they will eat food because, or any kind of food really, because they want to get that taste, but then they will spit it out and because they're so afraid of swallowing it and losing weight. We also see behaviors that are recommended by the bariatric team, but then they become compulsive. So when people have bariatric surgery, they are recommended to weigh themselves regularly, but regularly might mean once a day or a couple times a week. It doesn't mean 10 times a day. They may, re we recommend exercise, but we don't recommend exercising two hours a day. Um, keeping an eye on what you're eating, but maybe not monitoring and measuring it extremely excessively. One of the things that can really help um, people that you may feel may be more at risk of bariatric surgery are preoperative groups to really educate people quite a bit. One of the things that I hear very frequently is that um, after surgery, people who are having problems are that they had no idea about this whole addiction transfer stuff. They didn't think they'd have any problems with eating after surgery. They didn't think that they would have problems with alcohol and that they just feel um, kind of bamboozled. So signs that you might have that one of your clients or patients might be really struggling after bariatric surgery. So um, hiding, hiding their bodies, criticizing their weight. Um, a lot of times we see in our patients that they lose so much weight so quickly that they actually still see themselves as being very large and they may still not be able to recognize that they are thin, um, even when they get too thin. Relationship concerns, avoiding sex, avoiding intimacy, being preoccupied with food, having regrets about having the bariatric surgery, regretting not being able to eat as much, wishing that they could still do that. I've had people that have said, hey, I lost the weight, but I feel like I lost my best friend because now I don't get that comfort that I used to get, and I wish I would have never done that. Um, some behaviors, when you see that people have gained back their weight, that they're using alcohol or substances or more alcohol or substances. Of course, if they're having suicidal thoughts, um, depression, high anxiety, um, grazing throughout the day, not complying with what they're supposed to be doing with their bariatric team, um, vomiting after um, eating. Now, 
to some extent, most people that have had bariatric surgery will have some of that. But if they have a lot of that, that might be more of a concern. Not following up, um, not being compliant. I talked about grazing, snacking, eating between meals. Typically the binge, um, the bariatric surgery patient is recommended to eat three meals and then um, to drink a cup of, of milk between meals because that will fill them up and also help them get more protein and calcium in. Binge eating, which could, um, could be translated into feeling a lack of control when eating, not being able to stop. Oops. So let me quickly talk about two case studies. So this first one, the second one is mine. This first one is actually not mine. She was my coworkers that we, we discussed in consultation. So this patient was a 32 year old female Caucasian who had had a ruin Y procedure. She had a history of depression um, and she was having a lot of difficulties with relationships, with her personal relationships, with her marriage, friendships. Um, she was drinking four glasses of wine every night. Um, she did not necessarily see this as a problem. Um, she thought that this was just more of a way to relax and um, she was trying to reduce a lot of social anxiety with doing this, particularly since she was having difficulties with her husband. Then because um, her inhibitions were down when she would drink, then she would actually binge. And what I talked about with the fluids, she would actually, um, the pouch, she would flush out her pouch with wine <laughs> and then eat more to binge. And so basically it was kind of like a double whammy here. So basically she came to us, um, my colleague, because she had regained almost all of her weight and she didn't know why. So what my colleague ended up doing was a ton of motivational interviewing, really working on the alcohol use first, talking a lot about, um, educating her a lot about this. Um, she did refer her to alcohol treatment, which she did do. Um, and uh, she worked, I think, a lot with some of her emotions behind that as well. Second case study, so this was this woman was mine, so I can talk a little bit more about her. Um, again, a female, 55-year-old female, Caucasian, also post Ru and Y. I saw her about a year after her Ru and Y procedure because she had a BMI of about 18.3, which is under pretty underweight. She met criteria for anorexia nervosa. Um, and she was depressed. Basically, I was seeing her because she lost over 150 pounds in a year. I think that she started out, her BMI was about 45, and she went down to, like I said, about 18.3. So she was having all kinds of physical problems, malnutrition, um, fainting, um, was medically unstable, pretty concerning. So what we ended up doing actually was we hospitalized her. <laughs> so she was on our inpatient unit initially because she was so um, she was so medically unstable. And then we ended up getting her medically stable and um, getting her weight back up, which she had a very difficult time with both psychologically and physically. One of the things that we do in getting somebody's weight up when they've lost too much weight and they have a pouch is that we actually do all the opposite of what we recommend that they do. So instead of telling her to avoid fluids during meals, we actually had her drink fluids during meals so that she could actually eat more. Um, one of the things that we worked on a lot was that she was having some massive identity problems. Um, her husband, where they had not had any um, 
sexual relationship for about 10 years. All of a sudden, he wanted to have sex all the time. Um, and she was very, very hurt by this, that he was attracted to her now, that she was underweight and he didn't find her attractive when she was overweight. She was really starting to um, wonder who she was, if she loved her husband, what she wanted to do in life. Um, she went back to school to explore that. So really a lot of hardcore identity stuff and um, really looking at how she was really using um, under eating to try to control situations around her that were out of control, as well as a hope that maybe if she lost enough weight, her husband wouldn't be interested in her anymore. Um, she also had, it, it turned out later that I found out that she also had a history of rape that she had not talked about. And so it also made sense that this was coming up quite a bit as well. So we now have, oh good, seven minutes <laughs> for questions. So I don't know if there are any questions, comments, if anybody has their, um, has client experiences with this that they had questions about that they wanted to share or discuss a bit, knowing that this is an open forum. And so um, to try to disguise this if they do choose to talk about that. Hello, Andrea. Thank you for the, the presentation. A lot of new information I know for, for a lot of us out there. We have one question so far from okay. Susan. And Susan asked, why are doctors recommending these surgeries when the prevalence of these issues you're talking about, not to mention long-term weight gain, regain is so high? Yeah, that's an excellent question. Um, and I think that the, there's no easy answer to this actually. I think that, um, honestly, with people who are good candidates for this and who are very well prepared, where they are well educated, they know what to do going in, and they have had a tremendous amount of prep for this, like sometimes doing a bariatric diet before they have bariatric surgery, um, doing quite a bit of therapy, they actually do pretty well. And so with those candidates, we see people that they lose the weight, they keep it off. Some people gain um, maybe 10% of their weight back, but you know, if you lose 100 pounds, that's like 10 pounds, that's not too bad. Um, and they have this amazing um, increase in quality of life and um, people get their type two diabetes turned around and um, all kinds of stuff. Um, but it really is, I, I don't like to present things as black and white or either or, you know, I'm a big gray person, <laughs> but we do see a lot of either ors here. We see people that completely crash and burn that were not assessed properly or not educated um, beforehand. Um, and, we pe and we see people that do fantastic and it's the best thing that's ever happened to them. It's a tough one. Thank you for answering that question. Um, we have another question here from Joe, who asked, can you speak to the importance in maintaining collaboration between the surgical and psychiatric management teams longitudinally, five yes. to 10 years, for the purpose of monitoring drug bioavailability and the treatment of depressive symptoms? Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, I think that from both sides, Okay, because, um, and that's such a great question because I see, we always recommend that people follow up with their bariatric team for the rest of their lives. <laughs> and people are just like, oh my gosh, you're kidding me. But, but really they, you know, and, and that may be for some people once a month, it may be once a year, but they need to be rechecked. Um, they need to be making sure that they're doing okay. And part of that is so that their bariatric team can have eyes on them, not just to make sure that they're doing okay bariatrically, but also to make sure that they're doing okay behaviorally. And not all, but I think that a lot of bariatric nurses and physicians have gotten, um, and dietitians have gotten um, increasingly more educated at being able to recognize signs of depression, anxiety, substance use, abuse, and being able to refer then to psychologists. Um, 
and I, I think that there's become a much greater collaboration with behavioral health and bariatric surgery because of that. Okay, great, thank you. It's always good to have, have people's caregivers connected. Um, Diane asks, have you observed substance use problems with stimulants in post-surgical patients with eating disorders? Oh, that is such a good question. Um, you know, I haven't, but I, I don't, okay, let me, let me answer this with a caveat. Okay. So I used to see more bariatric patients. I am no longer actually working right now in the, in our bariatric center. When I used to see bariatric patients, stimulant abuse was there, but I don't think it was quite as rampant as it has, as it is now. Um, however, I would imagine, um, I want to check on that actually, because I would imagine that that would be huge because we do see a, a ton of stimulant abuse in our people um, here with eating disorders who don't have bariatric surgery. And I'd imagine that you'd see it without, you know, after bariatric surgery as well. Okay, thank you for answering that. Um, and we have one final question here. Rebecca asks, how does one approach someone, a client or a family member, if if there is if they they're suspected of having an eating disorder? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's. I think, and there's no easy answer to this either. I think that the big the big thing is being able to approach them in a loving, concerned way, to be able to get them some to get them by themselves. You know, not do like a hardcore you know big intervention, but to basically let them know, hey, I'm really worried about you. Um, I've noticed differences in um, your personality. Um, you don't seem to spend as much time with me anymore. So not just even focusing on appearance differences, like if the person's gained weight, lost weight, but also things like um, personality changes, um, mood, um, if you notice things with appearance that don't just have to do with weight, skin, hair, and talking about being really concerned about their health and offering to accompany them to um, a specialist, make appointment, may, you know, to call up with them and make an appointment at the Melrose Center or somewhere else, but being able to offer um, to be with them because people um, usually do not want to get rid of their eating disorders at first. Okay. Well, thank you so much for your, your presentation today, Andrea. And I, on behalf of the Minnesota Center for Chemical and Mental Health, I'd like to thank you all for joining us for today's webinar broadcast. And an extra special thanks to Dr. Andrea Zoleg, Carmen Hansen, and Nikki Zeidner at Melrose Center for making this happen. Great. Thanks so much.